I'm Joy Wolfram from the Mayo Clinic, and I'd like to say hello today. I'm very excited to be here. I want to say, um, I want to thank Hello Tomorrow for organizing this amazing event, and I want to say hello to the future of nanomedicine, which really has the potential to change the way we treat disease. So today I'll talk about what nanomedicine really is, and then I'll go on to highlight the major advantages of applying nanotechnology to medical applications. And then I'll end by uh, discussing some promising future directions in the field of nanomedicine. So what is nanotechnology? This is technology on the nanoscale, so one to a thousand nanometers, depending on what definition you look at. And what does it mean to be on the nanoscale? So a water molecule is 0.1 nanometers. A sugar molecule is one nanometer. When we talk about viruses and bacteria, they're around 20 nanometers to 1,000. And then a tennis ball is 100 million nanometers. So nanotechnology really has the potential to revolutionize several fields. For instance, the computer industry, where the size of the components of computer chips becomes smaller and more efficient. Another example is solar power technology, where the individual units of solar panels become smaller. When we talk about medicine, most conventional drugs are small molecules, so around one nanometer. And then a few decades ago, we started seeing antibodies being used as therapeutic agents, and they're around 10 nanometers. And today, we also have several nanoparticles that are clinically approved, usually around 100 nanometers. So on the contrary to these two first examples, when we talk about nanotechnology in medicine, we're actually going larger. So what are the benefits of going larger? Or in other words, what are the advantages of nanomedicine? And the first advantage is multifunctionality. So because nanoparticles are larger than conventional drugs, we can add extra features that help us improve therapeutic efficacy and increase safety for patients. The second advantage is that these unique electromagnetic properties appear on the nanoscale. And they're not really apparent when a material is in its bulk format or as a small molecule, and we can utilize these properties for therapeutic purposes. And the third advantage is that nanoparticles are differently processed by the body compared to conventional drugs, and we can also take advantage of this. So I'll briefly talk about all three advantages, and I'll start by discussing multifunctionality. So on this slide, you see a multifunctional nanoparticle. So the most simple um, example of multifunctionality in nanomedicine is solubilization. So for instance, a lot of cancer drugs are not water-soluble. So to give them to patients, we need to use toxic solvents. So sometimes the side effects that these cancer patients experience are not from the actual medi medication, it's from the solvent. And to avoid this, we can instead load these non-water-soluble drugs inside nanoparticles. And a clinically approved example is abraxane, which is a protein-based nanoparticle bound to paclitaxel, a chemotherapy agent, and it's clinically approved for several different cancers. Another example is degradation. So nanoparticles can protect drugs from breaking down. So, for example, in the blood, there's a lot of enzymes that destroy RNA. So if we want to use RNA-based therapeutics, we need to protect them in some way. And a clinical stage example is patiserin. This is a lipid-based nanoparticle with small interfering RNA. It just completed phase three clinical trials and will most likely be the first in its category to receive clinical approval, and this drug is to treat an uh, inherited condition that causes nerve damage. A third example of multifunctionality is immunoevasion. So we can modify the surface of nanoparticles to hide them from the immune system. 
And the most common way of doing this is by conjugating a polymer called polyethylene glycol to the surface of nanoparticles. And this polymer will attract water molecules. So when the immune cells see the nanoparticle, all they recognize is this hydration layer, and they don't see it as a foreign object. A clinically proved example is doxyl. This is a lipid-based nanoparticle with this polymer on the surface. Um, with doxorubicin, a chemotherapy agent. Another example is targeting. So we can add targeting ligands to the surface of nanoparticles. And these targeting ligands recognize biomolecules that are overexpressed in disease tissue. And there are some clinical stage examples, but we don't yet have um, any uh, clinically approved targeted nanoparticles. We can also add imaging agents or contrast agents into the same nanoparticle that we have our therapeutic drugs. And this means that we can actually track the nanodrugs inside the body, and this is called a theranostic approach. And there's a lot of preclinical studies, and we haven't yet seen any clinical stage examples. The other advantage of nanomedicine is multifunctionality in regards to putting several drugs, different drugs, inside the same nanoparticle. And the example uh, of a clinically approved drug is Vyxias. It's a lipid-based nanoparticle with two different chemotherapeutic agents. We can also exploit triggered activation strategies, where a specific trigger in the disease tissue will cause the nanoparticle to be activated or release the drugs. And there are some examples of these type of strategies um, at the clinical stage. In addition to this, we can add permeation agents together with the drugs inside nanoparticles. And these permeation agents, they break down the extracellular matrix of the disease tissue and improve drug diffusion and nanoparticle diffusion. And these are still in preclinical uh, studies. The, the second advantage of nanomedicine are these unique electromagnetic properties that can be optical, magnetic, electronic, or thermal. And the take-home message is that they're not apparent on the molecular scale or the macro scale, but only on the nanoscale. And the reason for this is that nanoparticles have a large surface area to volume ratio, and they're also in the same size range as the wavelength of light. And together, these reasons cause nanoparticles to display unique characteristics that we can exploit for therapeutic purposes. So a clinical stage example is Nanotherm. So the company is Magforce. So it's clinically approved in Europe for the treatment of glioblastoma and other tumors. And it's based on local injection of iron oxide nanoparticles into the brain of patients. The patients are then placed in a magnetic field, and this field causes the iron oxide nanoparticles to heat up and essentially kill the tumors through uh, thermal elevations. The third uh, advantage of nanomedicine is that nanoparticles are differently processed by the body compared to conventional drugs. And what we try to do is achieve high accumulation of medications in diseased tissues and low accumulation in healthy organs to avoid side effects. And one of the ways we do this is by taking advantage of distinct characteristics of pathological tissues. So for example, cancer blood vessels differ in two major ways from normal vasculature. The first way is that they have slower blood flow. And this is because as a tumor grows, it needs to quickly recruit a vasculature network in order to get nutrients and get rid of waste products. And because this process is fast, it's disorganized and chaotic, and this disorganization causes the blood flow to be slow, especially in certain regions of the tumor. The second difference is that cancer blood vessels have these fenestrations or holes that are usually not present in uh, normal vessels. And this is because cancer blood vessels are immature, so they don't have time to form this continuous barrier. And so we asked, can we take advantage of this? And the answer was yes. So to take advantage of the slower blood flow, we designed these disc-shaped microparticles. 
And these are 1,000 nanometers in diameter, so an example of a large nanoparticle. And then to take advantage of these holes, we designed smaller nanoparticles. And in the next few slides, I'll illustrate how each of these particles interact with the blood vessels. So mathematical and experimental studies have shown that this disc-shaped microparticle is optimal for flowing close to the blood vessel wall, and this is due to fluid dynamics and physics. And also, because these microparticles have a large surface area, they tend to bind to the vessel wall. So in normal vasculature, the microparticles still bind because they're designed to do so, but because the blood flow is fast, it causes the particles to dislodge. So we only see this transient adhesion. If we look at tumor vasculature, the particles bind, and they stay adhered to the surface because the blood flow is slower and doesn't cause them to detach. So this is a way of increasing microparticles in diseased tissue and reducing their accumulation in normal organs. Then when it comes to nanoparticles, they can enter into the tissue if the blood vessels have holes. So in normal vasculature, there's typically no gaps in the endothelial wall, so the nanoparticles do not enter from the blood. However, in tumor vasculature, they can go through these fenestrations into the tumor tissue. And if we compare this to conventional drugs that are small molecules, they're so small that they go everywhere, regardless of whether the blood vessels have fenestrations. So it's very difficult to get site-specific delivery of conventional drugs. So then we can also combine this microparticle with nanoparticles. So we can load the nanoparticles inside the pores of a microparticle. And what will happen is that the microparticles will bind to tumor vasculature and release the nanoparticles that can then enter the tissue through these fenestrations. And this platform was developed at the Houston Methodist Hospital in the United States. And Dr. Mauro Ferrari is leading this development, and it will go into to clinical trials next year. So we're very excited to see if this could potentially benefit patients um, with uh, cancer. So now I've talked about the three advantages of uh, nanomedicine, and now I'd like to highlight um, some promising future directions in the field. So the first uh, promising direction is engineered exosomes, and I'll explain what that is. The second is modifying the microenvironment, and the third is companion diagnostics. So exosomes are lipid-based nanoparticles, around 100 nanometers, and they're released by all your cells all the time. And every single biological fluid that has been studied, whether it's blood, urine, cerebrospinal fluid, pancreatic juice, it contains these exosomes. And these exosomes play a very important role in cell communication, both over long and short distances in the body. So they're like the body's text message system. And what we can do is we can isolate them from biological fluids or from cells that we grow in the lab and load drugs inside them. So they become nanocarriers. And I think this technology is extremely promising because these exosomes have evolved through millions of years of evolution for efficient transport of biomolecules in the body. So if we can tap into this naturally occurring transport system and engineer it to our advantage, I think the potential for this research area is endless, and this is also something that my lab is working on. The second promising future direction is modifying the microenvironment for improved nano delivery. So a lot of um, approaches have focused on changing the tumor microenvironment, for instance, increasing vasculature permeability or reducing the extracellular matrix um, through different strategies. However, a new way of thinking about this is to also modify healthy tissue. And this is because over 90% of nanoparticles that we inject into the blood, whether it's synthetic nanoparticles, bacteria, viruses, cell fragments, they will all end up in the liver because this is the body's filtering system. 
So this organ has immune cells that eat anything nano-sized from the blood system. So if we're trying to treat a disease that is not based in the liver, this becomes problematic. So we thought, what if we can develop a strategy to temporarily deactivate the immune cells in the liver and stop them from eating the nanoparticles? And interestingly, we found that chloroquine, an anti-malarial drug approved in the 1940s, could block this um, nanoparticle uptake in the liver. And this paper was just published, and we're very excited about it. And this strategy is simple and broadly applicable, potentially, to several of the nanodrugs that are already clinically approved. So we're excited to see in the future whether this could benefit um, patients that receive nanodrugs. And the third promising direction in nanomedicine is companion diagnostics. So this is a test that provides information for the effective use of a drug. So when it comes to nanomedicine, these tests could be biomarkers that tell us about vasculature features or extracellular matrix content in disease tissue, or it could be various tissue imaging techniques that can then be analyzed to give us information about the disease tissue. And the implications of this is that we can identify patients that would be well-suited for nanomedicine. So let's say we take an image of a patient tumor, analyze it, and see that the blood vessels have big fenestrations. We could then assume that this patient would benefit from nanomedicine. We can also go one step further, and we can match specific nanoparticle types with disease phenotypes. So as you can see, there's great potential for major breakthroughs in medicine by applying nanotechnology. So with that being said, I want to summarize the mission of my lab at the Mayo Clinic, which is consistently ranked the best hospital in the United States. And the mission is to develop new nanomedicine treatments for life-threatening diseases, and we're mostly focused on cancer and tissue injury. And the reality is that patients are dying every day, so our mission is very urgent and important. And to make this happen, and to be innovative, I also believe that we need to increase gender and racial diversity in science. So, um, to end this talk, I want to answer three questions. The first answer is yes, we need to change the world, and we need to change it now. The second answer is yes, we need more women leaders and racial minority leaders in science. And the third answer is yes, we need your support to make this a reality. So please get in touch. My email is wolfram.joy at mayo.edu. Thank you.